Zack Snyder made his directorial debut in 2004 with the reboot of the 1978 Dawn of the Dead. Snyder's Dawn of the Dead is the perfect place to start when looking at his work, not just because it was his first movie, but because it establishes almost every main theme that he explores in the rest of his filmography. It's also an interesting study in Snyder's strengths and weaknesses as a filmmaker. And I just want to stress, if you like Snyder's movies, that's okay! <laughs> his films are incredibly visual, and a lot of people tune in just to watch the punches and the abs. Hopefully this video will actually help you see more in Snyder's work. So let's dive into Dawn of the Dead. The film opens with a 10 minute sequence showing the beginnings of a zombie infection spreading through the city, with no real answers about why it's happening. Then we see the opening title sequence, which establishes the major themes of the movie. As the sequence begins, first we see a wide shot of a group of Muslims praying at a mosque in unison, accompanied by the sound of a chant, plus a spooky music cue. Second, we see this medium shot, a degraded image of what appears to be a lifeless body, along with a jump scare sound. Third, we see an extreme close-up of a zombified man, and this image not only moves, but the image itself has been chopped up, mutilated, to give the action a disjointed, inhuman look, along with an inhuman scream. Even though the three images are clearly three different subjects, the combination of sound design, the use of closer and closer shots, and the thematic throughline all combine to suggest that this is a progression over time, from human to zombie. These three images lead up to the very title of the film itself. This is the dawn. This is the beginning of the zombie apocalypse. As the credit sequence continues, we hear the Johnny Cash song, When the Man Comes Around, which describes the Christian apocalypse from the Book of Revelations. Islam? Scary. Christianity? Cool. Anyone familiar with American culture in 2004 should be well aware that we were at the height of Islamophobia in the wake of 9-11 and George Bush's subsequent invasion of Iraq in 2003. And of course, two years later, Snyder also made 300, which was literally screened by the US military to psych up soldiers who were going into battle in the Middle East. But back to Dawn of the Dead. About half an hour into the film, towards the beginning of Act 2, we get a more thorough explanation for the zombie infection where we see the character CJ watching the news. First, we're watching TV with CJ while he gets frustrated with the talking heads for not having any new answers. You guys are so full of shit. I've been saying the same Everybody damn thing all day. Gets up. Tell me something I don't know, asshole! The lack of meaningful information is emphasized by shots like this, where CJ is surrounded by television screens, as if he's overwhelmed by meaningless noise. The news anchor signs off and switches over to the emergency broadcast system. But instead of a helpful emergency broadcast, we see this Christian fundamentalist pastor. Apparently, Zack Snyder thinks that during an emergency, the most important person that we can listen to is a televangelist. And the pastor gives us the explanation that we've been waiting for since the beginning of the movie. Hell is overflowing, and Satan is sending his dead to us. Why? Because you have sex out of wedlock. You kill unborn children. You have men-on-man -man relations. Same-sex how do you think your God will judge you? And there we have it. This edgy, cool, action-packed zombie thriller is actually about the Christian Bible. Yay! So Snyder sets up this mysterious air around the question of why this is happening. A question that was clouded by overwhelming, useless information. And by the time the scene ends, we have our simple, easily digestible rationale. In the words of the pastor, Now we know. Now we know that we are being punished for our gay! I know some people will want to dismiss this analysis by saying that these images are satire, that the film isn't supposed to be taken at face value. To which, first, I'll say, no it's not! Secondly, there was a version of this scene that had a much more satirical take on Christianity. It's an older version of the script that was probably much more in line with James Gunn's intentions before he eventually left the project. The scene showed a TV reporter citing Bible passages as if she lost her mind, not even processing what she's saying. In the background, employees walk back and forth in a daze, one of them clearly bitten. 
But that chaotic scene turned into this one. Not a reporter mindlessly quoting the Bible, but a pastor calmly and sternly telling us that we're bad boys and girls. If you're doing satire, it's your responsibility to make that satire clear, which Snyder doesn't even attempt to do with his Dawn of the Dead. There's a corny sincerity to the preacher's scene, just like there's a corny sincerity to pretty much all of Snyder's work. Much like this commercial that Snyder directed that features a line of horses bowing to the New York City skyline where the Twin Towers used to be. Ah, satire. So, uh, no, the Christian pastor is not satirical. The Islamophobia is not satirical. The homophobia is not satirical. Sure, some people will laugh at this scene. I guess the first time I knew I was gay, I was 13. I remember he had the most astonishing blue eyes. Oh my God, I'm in hell. <laughs> but they're not laughing because it's some kind of deep social criticism. They're laughing because they think homophobia is funny. Plus, he's inserted random references to homophobia in his other movies. I don't hate the sinner. I hate the sin. The satire argument feels like an excuse that people give when confronted with uncomfortable truths about their favorite director's work. Oh, also, I know that the pastor isn't satire because it's explicitly modeled after something that happened in real life. After 9-11, Reverend Jerry Falwell placed the blame for the tragedy squarely on sex, feminism, homosexuality, and abortion. The pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who tried to secularize America, I point the thing in their face and say, you helped this happen. The entirety of Snyder's Dawn of the Dead is an extrapolation of Falwell's argument. Society is punished because they didn't worship the Christian God enough. From the scene, you might have thought to yourself, well, CJ will probably turn into a good Christian by the end, right? He'll probably learn to turn the other cheek to the zombies. But actually, the weird thing is that this character doesn't really change at all. Early on, CJ is characterized as a selfish, pushy jerk. Find some place else. Look, we just need a place. Maybe you didn't hear me. But by the end of the movie, he's still a jerk. What are you doing? In nursery school. And this was one of Snyder's go-to tropes. Brooding, put-upon men who are violent and selfish, who are somehow still the hero without changing, growing, learning any lessons, or having any character development. They are anti-heroes, but just without any of the redeeming qualities of conventional anti-heroes. One of the few times that we see Snyder redeem characters, it's the orderlies in Sucker Punch, who were complicit with the abuse in the asylum the entire movie, but suddenly you have an unmotivated, unconvincing change of heart at the end. I'm not hurting these girls anymore. I'm not doing this. Snyder even changes source material so he can feature characters who refuse to redeem themselves, like Rorschach and Watchmen, who is framed in the comic books as a danger to society because of how out of touch he is with his humanity and how quick he is to resort to violence, but who Snyder reframes as the only one who really understands what's going on, the one who's willing to do what needs to be done, as if violent vigilantes are a necessary part of the justice system. Even going so far as to have Mr. Rowell appear in this scene, which he definitely was not in the comic, just so that he can show us what a tragedy Rorschach's death is by giving us a melodramatic, Darth Vader, knee-bent, snowy particle effect drenched scream. even changes the visual of Rorschach's death, from a meaningless wisp of blood to an icon of a Rorschach test, which is literally a thing that you're told to look at and ask to infuse with meaning. But Snyder's take on good and evil is even weirder than that. His heroes and villains often share a common goal or even a common philosophy. In Man of Steel, Jor-El and Zod both want the Codex. The first time we meet Jor-El, he is demanding that the Supreme Council give him the Codex to ensure the Kryptonians survive after Krypton blows up, but the Supreme Council refuses. Luckily, Zod also shows up and uses violence to try and get his hands on the Codex. They duke it out, and because Zod has already pushed aside the Supreme Council, Jor-El is able to snag the Codex and send it to Earth along with his baby boy, just like Jor-El wanted from the beginning. Sure, Jor-El says that he doesn't approve of Zod's methods, but Zod's terrorist attack is the thing that leads to Jor-El getting what he wanted. 
Without Dodd's application of violence, Jorwell would still be standing in the Supreme Council, bickering with the politicians. If we didn't previously know that Zod was a bad guy, you might even get the impression that Zod and Jor-El were working together. Similarly, in Batman v Superman, Superman wants to act unilaterally as a private military contractor, and Lex Luthor wants to act unilaterally as a private military weapons contractor. Senator Fitch happens to stand in both of their way. Luckily, Lex Luthor has hidden a bomb to violently eliminate Senator Finch. Sure, Superman says that he doesn't approve of Luthor's methods, but Luthor's terrorist attack is the thing that leads to Superman getting what he wanted. Without Luther's application of violence, Superman would still be sitting in Congress, bickering with the politicians. So it's no surprise that when Superman takes off right after the explosion, the news media starts wondering if Superman and Luther were working together. Snyder writes heroes who can only achieve their goals as a direct result of terrible acts of violence, whether that violence is done by a hero or by someone else often specifically terrorist violence. It's a bizarre, unhealthy combination of might makes right and the ends justify the means. And I think it's pretty telling that in both of these Superman-related examples, the thing that stood in the way was representative government. Maybe this is why Snyder's Superman never says, Truth, justice, and the American way. We think of the American way as democracy and freedom, but this Superman and this jor both seem to view democracy as inconvenient. They don't seem to care about the actual lives lost in the destruction of Krypton, or the destruction of Metropolis, or the destruction of Congress. Superman doesn't even look sad about the bombing. He looks mildly annoyed, or constipated, and instead of helping injured people, he just flees the scene of the crime. A mere 20 minutes later in the movie, Superman returns because his mom and his girlfriend are in trouble and seems to have forgotten about any of these people. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here's Princess Weeks, co-host of PBS's It's Lit, YouTuber, and baller, to give us a bit more context about Superman's relationship to his home planet. Thank you, Maggie. Yes, as someone who respects Superman for his goodness and has no desire to see him be Batman, I want to quickly talk about Superman's origin and his connection to Krypton and the people he couldn't save. It bears to keep in mind that Jerry Siegel and Joseph Schuster, the creators of Superman, were both the sons of Jewish immigrants whose families had left behind an old world to create a new home in the United States and in Canada, much as Superman was made to do so after the destruction of Krypton. However, it was under Mort Wesinger that we got to see the pathos of Superman's connected legacy to his lost world, with the creation of the bottle city of Kandor especially. Kandor was a futuristic city of Krypton that had been captured, miniaturized, and placed in a bell jar by the villain Brainiac. He invented the Funko Pop. When Superman gets Kandor back, it becomes a way for him to explore the culture of Krypton and the life that he was forced to leave behind when the planet exploded. As Grant Morrison puts it in Super Gods, boop, 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 in Kandor, lost memories were preserved under glass. And Superman could go there in private to experience a world he left behind. Kandor was every snow globe, and music box that stood for every bittersweet memory in every movie there would ever be. Candor was the tingling voice of a lost world, a past that might have been unreachable. Candor was survivor's guilt endowed with new meaning. One of my favorite stories that explores this idea of loss for Superman is For the Man Who Has Everything by Alan Moore and illustrated by Dave Gibbons. An alien warlord named Mongol attaches this plant called the Black Mercy onto Superman's chest as a birthday gift. And it allows him to experience a realistic dream based on his heart's deepest desire which is, in this case, a normal life on Krypton, married with children. Because Superman is Superman because he's on Earth. 
on Earth, he carries on the legacy of Krypton. He is living for the dead, essentially. I think it was best put on the Supergirl episode of Crisis on Infinite Earths during the CW crossover, where Kara, Superman's cousin, talks to him about what they just experienced. Before our parents sent us to Earth, nobody here knew about Krypton. Now there are stories, celebrations, museum exhibits. Just like you shared our home with your family, we shared our home with this whole world. Krypton's not just a place, it's a spirit, it's hope, it's sacrifice. It's what our parents did for us, what you did for Jonathan. We have made our parents proud by fighting for what's right. So we have to keep fighting. And as long as that spirit is alive, Krypton will never die. And that is why I take huge issue with Snyder's view on Superman, this put upon hero who angsts about being a hero. Like, that's not Superman. It's not who he is. <clears throat> anyway, back to you, Maggie. Thanks, princess. So continuing on our journey through the Snyderverse, let's look at Watchmen and how the changes that Snyder made emphasize the idea that unilateral violence is not only necessary to get things done, but it's also cool and good. In the original comic, Ozymandias fakes an attack on New York City, which ends up uniting the USA and USSR against a common enemy. But in the comic book, this moment of unity is undermined by Rorschach's journal ending up in the hands of a far-right newspaper, telegraphing that the peace will not last, and that all the death and destruction that Ozymandias caused was ultimately for nothing. The final image is the doomsday clock striking midnight, covered in blood. The ends did not justify the means. Might did not make right. The terrible ramifications of Rorschach's journal ending up in the far-right newspaper is the entire basis for the Watchmen TV show. However, Snyder's version eliminates the original visual of the doomsday clock striking at midnight. Instead, we end on Rorschach's journal and a line of voiceover that calls all the way back to the beginning of the entire story. Rorschach's journal, October 12th, 1985. Tonight. A comedian died in New York. Cut to black and cue the rockin' jams. Snyder's ending throws away Moore's point about violence begetting violence and the criticisms of nuclear deterrence. Instead, it suggests that, whoa, we found the movie, guys! It's cyclical rather than final, quirky and self-referential rather than a commentary on war. Alan Moore was trying to tell us that the cold, calculating villain like Ozzy Mendias was wrong, that mass murder begets mass murder. Snyder's version is telling us that we need villains like Ozzy Mendias, that mass murder is a fact of life, or maybe even necessary. It reduces the impact of the entire story to a simple pop culture artifact, rather than a dire warning about the dangers of unchecked aggression, which is hilarious, and by hilarious I mean sad, because the original comic book was critiquing our pop culture artifacts. Even Snyder's heroes have this one of us has to suffer for the other person's life to get better mentality. Towards the end of Sucker Punch, Baby Doll insists that the only way Sweet Pea can escape is if Baby Doll sacrifices herself, knowing that she will be lobotomized. I'm gonna walk out there, and when they come after me, you go, okay? There's gotta be another way. No. Female empowerment. No. His villains end up correct. His heroes display annoyingly selfish qualities. It's like violence is characterized in these films as calculus, always using the ends to justify the means. As long as the outcome is X, then it's okay that 100 buildings were destroyed and 3,000 people died in Metropolis. This moral calculus is the entire point of the story in Batman v Superman, where Pa Kent tells Clark about the time that he saved his farm from a flood, resulting in the destruction of the farm next door. We blocked the water all right, we sent it upstream. The whole lane farm washed away. While I ate my hero cake, their horses were drowning. Somebody had to die. Somebody has to suffer. There's no way to help everyone. Not even for a godlike superhero. Even though we'd seen Superman uh, literally turn back time. <laughs> you know what kind of hero makes that argument? The kind of hero who needs an excuse for when their actions end up hurting more people than they help. The kind of hero who's covering up for how bad they are at their job. 
In this universe, community becomes meaningless because someone has to suffer in every interaction. You can't view your neighbors as friends and allies. You have to view them as sacrificial lambs for your own well-being. This kind of thinking leads us to believe that things like universal health care are impossible because how could we possibly do something that benefits everyone? It leads us to argue that there's nothing to be done about cops killing innocent people because violence and death are simply to be expected. It's a flawed theory that when repeated over and over in Snyder's work, it ends up feeling less like, oh, well, Snyder was making an interesting statement about Superman and more like Snyder can't imagine anything outside of his narrow view of the world. So it makes perfect sense that the creepy thing about Dawn of the Dead is... It seems to suggest that a zombie apocalypse is kinda good, actually. The zombie apocalypse is terrible, but like, don't we kinda deserve it for our sins? Aren't we naughty boys and girls who need to be punished for having abortions and looking at a titty? After all, isn't this God's plan? So if CJ is the audience stand-in, then what do we make of his violent, explosive death? Why does he have to die like this? Well, in Snyder's filmatic universe, it's less about whether or not someone dies, but how they die that matters. And this is because in Snyder's films, everyone is already dead. The idea that there is no use helping people because they're already dead is a constant truth in the Snyderverse. It might be his most often repeated sentiment in all of his movies. Dude, everybody's dead. They're already dead. Your mom's dead. We're already dead. Brother's dead. Everybody here is already dead. Everyone's dead. Forget them. They're dead. That fat chick at Dairy Queen? Dead. And once you start recognizing this pattern, it really opens up Snyder's work to other examples. Like Superman saying, My world doesn't exist anymore. Or Dr. Manhattan's Calvinist view of the universe. Everything is preordained. Or Baby Doll accepting that she absolutely must sacrifice herself at the end of Sucker Punch. There's gotta be another way. No. Or Bruce Wayne saying that humankind is the fallen. Things fall. Things on Earth. And what falls is fallen. Or the soldiers in 300 marching to their suicide mission. Or the crowd in Batman v Superman celebrating the Day of the Dead. Or the zombies in Dawn of the Dead being literally dead. Pretty much all of Snyder's narratives ends up being pointless because everything is already decided and everyone is already dead. This idea is so comically overused in Snyder's work, it even affected the PR for Batman v Superman. When asked where Robin is, Ben Affleck explained that in the Snyderverse, Robin is already dead. My God. Leave Robin alone! I'm already dead. We're already dead. You're already dead. There's no use saving the world. Everyone is already dead. Even when Bruce Wayne gives his little speech at the end of Batman v Superman that's supposed to be hopeful, he says, We fight. We kill. We betray one another. But we can rebuild. There's no indication that we should stop fighting. Stop killing, stop betraying one another. Just that we should rebuild on the corpses while people keep treating each other horribly. Because we're already dead! So because we're already dead, what matters in Snyder's cinematic language is that you make sure you die a symbolic death. Die for an idea. Die, but make it a spectacle. Pa Kent is the most obvious and laughable example of this getting dissolved into a tornado like an Alka-Seltzer. But one example that is not laughable is Baby Doll from Sucker Punch. Sorry if I get a little emotional here. Uh, I actually think this is one of the most fucked up sequences in Snyder's entire filmography. Content warning here for sexual assault, so jump to this time code if you'd rather skip it. When Baby Doll and Sweet Pea are about to escape, Baby Doll says that she needs to sacrifice herself to distract the guards so that Sweet Pea can get away. I'm gonna walk out there, and when they come after me, you go, okay? Instead of dying quickly in an explosion, or a tornado, or a cool hail of arrows, or getting blown to bits, Baby Doll's self-sacrifice lasts an entire sequence. After fighting with the guards, Baby Doll is taken to John Hamm's sex lair, where her rape is an allegory for her lobotomy. This is one of the only erotic scenes in Snyder's entire body of work. There are other sex scenes, but I would not use the word erotic to describe them. My most generous reading of this scene is that Baby Doll is somehow fantasizing about her own rape, since the narrative does play with fantasy and reality, and that would at least give her some agency. 
But I think it's also a valid reading to say that this rape is actually happening in reality, since the whole movie is about taking real-life traumas and putting them through a filter that is supposed to help us deal with them. So, either way, at the end of the scene, she gives John Hamm a look. Did you see the way she looked at me? This look is supposed to convey that she is defiant in her death, that she didn't go quietly. But what's odd is that the film acts as if this look is a satisfying conclusion to a character having just been raped and lobotomized. It's as if it's saying, it's okay guys, she got her revenge, by giving John Hamm a look. Boy, she gave him a look. That look, we got him. The final message of the film also adds insult to Baby Doll's injury. As Sweet Pea escapes to freedom, she says, Who teaches us what's real and how to laugh at lies? Who decides why we live and what we'll die to defend? Who chains us and who holds the key that can set us free? It's you. You have all the weapons you need. Rape involves literally having your agency taken away from you. It's someone actively negating your humanity and your ability to decide. It's the opposite of being set free. It's a tragic, disgusting end for Baby Doll that, because of a stink eye, is treated as if she's going down in a blaze of glory. Or that getting through to her rapist for a millisecond is somehow a win for the lobotomized Baby Doll, while he presumably goes on to continue to rape and lobotomize more female patients. I'm not going to get into how the message of Who chains us? And who holds the key that can set us free? It's you. Is just an easy way for a male director to completely sidestep the history of institutionalized patriarchy and sexual violence that leads to society building abusive systems that entrap, abuse, and sexually exploit people. I'm not getting into it. I realize Snyder was excited to write what he felt was a feminist movie, but it really only highlights his conservative take on these ideas that victimhood is a choice, that the system will somehow correct itself. I'm not hurting these girls anymore. I'm not doing this. For a moment, as a, a fun exercise, close your eyes and try to imagine a male protagonist in any of Snyder's films getting this type of ending. Snyder would never dream of having Alfred tell Batman, actually, when Superman killed all your employees, all you need to do is go back there and give him your old stink eye. But the example that feels the most Snyderverse-esque is... The guy from Law & Order vs. Zod's sidekick, Fora. During the battle on Main Street, USA, Fora and the SVU guy square off. She's clearly the superior one, and she tells him... A good death is its own reward. So we assume that he's about to get wrecked. By this point, Snyder has made it abundantly clear that Zod and his crew are absolutely irredeemably evil. So we might assume that by the end of the film, this idea that death is good and that it's actually a reward will be challenged and refuted. But again, Snyder doesn't necessarily disagree with the philosophies of his villains. A mere 30 minutes later in the movie, the SVU guy repeats that same line back to Fiora, even emphasizing it in a way that makes it sound irrefutably true. A good death is its own reward. Fiora wasn't wrong, she was just on the wrong team. The Snyderverse is preoccupied with dying and extravagant death, so much so that he ignores one really important thing, how we should live. And the result is a bunch of characters who are miserable, unloving, emotionally distant weirdos in their daily lives. His narratives demand that we embrace killing and death. But when a character he likes dies, <laughs> or Superman's mom is in trouble, we're suddenly expected to feel sad about it. This is the biggest and most consistent internal contradiction in Snyder's movies. These people don't matter. These people don't matter. Who cares about them? Don't care. Meaningless. Ew. Pfft, not that guy. Those people, bleh. Stop it. Don't look at me. Worthless. Oh my god, my mom and my mom, wife. No! Snyder doesn't just dismiss empathy. His narratives punish any character who remains empathetic in the face of death. Snyder's post-apocalypse has no room for sensitive men. In fact, the first death that we witness in Dawn of the Dead is Anna's kind, sensitive husband. One of the few unquestionably kind male characters in Snyder's entire filmography. Similarly, Michael ends up showing empathy for this father character in the middle of the movie. Michael makes it clear that he knows the father will turn into a zombie, despite Anna's hesitation. You've been bitten. It's only a matter of time. Are you sure it's the light? No. She's sure.
But even though Michael is sure, he refuses to kill the father, leaving that job to Ving Rhames. The father's death is inevitable. Anna and Michael's hesitation to kill, choosing to see humanity in the face of a zombie, would be considered admirable or heroic in some narratives, but because of the way the scene and the larger narrative is constructed, their feelings are framed as naive. They even jolt when they hear the shotgun, as if they're unprepared or unequipped for it. Narratively, we're shown that Michael's reluctance to kill was meaningless. His sympathy for the father character has no tangible effect on the father's fate. I'm sorry. Michael, who's shown empathy and a reluctance to kill throughout the film, dies alone. The only person he gets to take out is himself. He doesn't even get to take out any zombies with him, which in an action-packed zombie movie like this one is the best way you can go out. His inaction has led him here, isolated, trapped in limbo between the others who are able to escape and the zombies in the background. The bite on his arm tells us that he'll soon be one of them. CJ, on the other hand, gets to have that spectacular, cool, action hero death taking out a bunch of zombies along with him. We don't mourn him because a good death is its own reward. Michael's character arc is also a foil for Anna's character arc. While he remains sensitive and empathetic over the course of the film, Anna goes from being a nurse, whose literal job is to help the sick and tend to the wounded, to methodically shooting zombies in the head. I ever turn into one of those things? Do me a favor, blow my f***ing head off. Oh, yeah, you can count on that. A little longer than a few minutes later. I got it. Damn. Damn. Anna is one of the few people who survives because she's learned to shed her motherly nurturing instincts and become a killer. Oddly, Superman's arc in Man of Steel follows a similar path, from protector to killer. Early on, young Clark saves a bus full of children, but his dad tells him that sometimes people just have to die. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. Eventually, Superman's arc is complete when he brutally executes his enemy. We get the impression that Superman could have killed Zod earlier. His refusal to kill stood in the way. The movie is telling us that Superman's reluctance to kill was his weakness. He started his journey as a sensitive boy and ends the journey snapping another man's neck. And I think that's partly why, despite the huge CGI drenched action scenes, his movies can honestly end up being kind of boring. Especially character-wise. Everything is already determined, so the characters don't feel like they have any real agency or any ability to choose or any impact on their own stories. The thing is, you can make your characters engaging even if their fates are sealed. And you can do that by making your characters care, by making them feel things. However, in the Snyderverse, the worst thing that can happen to any character is that they might actually feel something. Rorschach's superpower is his lack of empathy. Baby Doll's story reaches its climax when she disassociates from her own body. The low point for Superman is realizing that he might actually have to feel something because it's his own mother who's in trouble. The thing that Superman is able to effectively communicate to Batman isn't the love for his mom. It's the terror of losing the parent. The terror of caring about someone. The Snyderverse, of all the director verses, would be the scariest place for anyone to live. The mean commenters under this video, you care too much. You would be obliterated in a Snyder movie. Me? I'd be ripped to death by zombies as an example of how even very hot gay women are not immune to the wrath of the Christian God. This is why I giggle when people say that Snyder's version of Superman is what it would be like if Superman really existed in our world. How would you know you'd be pummeled to death by falling concrete? Speaking of empathy, let's switch gears and compare Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead to the original 1978 version. When you watch these movies back to back, it is jarring because it feels like either Zack Snyder completely missed the point of Romero's film, or I would argue Snyder is actively arguing against Romero's message. The original film is not only a strong satire of consumerism, but it asks us to recognize people's humanity, even in the faces of the zombies themselves. A little over halfway through Romero's film, Steven and Peter rampage through the mall, killing zombies with pistols, fire, a car, and headshots from a high-powered rifle. But as the scene winds down, something strange happens. One of the zombies approaches Fran. She's safe behind a glass door because Romero's zombies shamble instead of run. 
Rather than trying to claw at her from one side of the glass, the zombie just plunks down on the ground. Fran looks sad and she stares at him, as if she's considering the humanity this person used to have. He stares back and you almost get the sense that he's forming a thought, that there's some glimmer of humanity buried deep within. Then the three humans walk around the second floor to look down at the result of their joy ride. Corpses scattered on the ground. The heartbreak is punctuated by the funeral march in the background. These are no longer dangerous enemies, but the remains of former humans. They're no longer the undead, they're simply the dead. The zombies' faces are mostly turned away from the camera, and those whose faces we can see are far away enough that the zombies' makeup is barely noticeable. So visually, we're forced to focus on their human forms rather than their inhuman faces. Throughout Romero's Dawn of the Dead, images like these recall the atrocities of conflicts like Vietnam. The film recalls the civil unrest of the 60s and 70s, and more specifically the racially motivated violence carried out by police. The whole first act is literally a SWAT team assaulting a black community supposedly to save them. Of course, this assault leads to mass death. In another scene, our heroes once again take a moment to regard the zombies with curiosity. The zombies paw at the glass door pathetically. They're less of a threat and more of a pathetic mass of mindless people. This scene contains two beats that Snyder used in his film, but Snyder separated the two ideas and modified them a bit. First, remember that preacher who blamed the zombies on sin? He's actually played by this actor, Ken Forey, who starred in the 1978 Dawn of the Dead. In the original version, when this character gives his explanation, he's quoting his grandfather, a voodoo priest. Voodoo. Granddad was a priest in Trinidad. He used to tell us, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. Snyder takes this idea attributed to voodoo and reappropriates it in the language of far-right Christian rhetoric. It's also a huge bummer because there are subtle hints in the original film that these two characters are gay. So to see Snyder erase that and then distort the narrative into something that's explicitly homophobic, it's just sad. Secondly, at the beginning of the scene, Steven says that the zombies are still coming for them. They're after us. They know we're still in here. But Peter corrects him, saying that the zombies aren't after the survivors. They're after the place. They don't know why they... Just remember, remember that they want to be in here. And under those lines, we get this shot of an empty mall. It's a clean, perfectly framed shot, as if it's an ad in a magazine. No dead bodies in sight. This moment illustrates the zombifying effect of capitalism and consumerism. Snyder takes this line, sets it outside the mall, and turns the logic around. Instead of, they're not coming for us. They're coming because capitalism rotted their brains. The explanation that Snyder gives is, why are they coming here? Memory, maybe. Instinct. Maybe they're coming for us. He ends on the idea that they are coming for us, suggesting that that is the answer. They want us. And this is just weird, but when Anna asks, why are they coming here? We don't get a shot of the mall. We get a shot of a parking lot and some landscaping. They're going to a parking lot out of memory and instinct? I know Zack Snyder means them all, but visually he's telling us they're coming to this parking lot. So it deflates the moment and pretty much erases the cultural criticism from the original film. But there's a third aspect to this scene, one that Snyder didn't just modify, but appears to have cut entirely. What the hell are they? They're us, that's all. To Romero, a zombie isn't just an undead horror. A zombie is someone who was once human. A zombie is a tragedy. Sure, it's cool to watch zombies' heads blow up, but what's horrifying is that that zombie could be you or me. And the movie has this fascinating tension throughout, played out on a local TV network, about whether or not the zombies can be considered human, whether or not the zombie condition can be reversed. One side wants to understand the epidemic and find a way to solve the problem. And the other side just simply wants to wipe them out. In Romero's zombie universe, zombies are a stand-in for fear rather than the direct threat. The zombies are just a catalyst that leads us to enact violence on each other. We see this when one of the cops loses it in the intro and starts blowing away humans. The zombies are his excuse to execute innocent people. Always got a man. Just as cops use race riots as an excuse to kill throughout American history. 
Just as our current administration uses a virus as an excuse to kill vulnerable people through inaction. But this idea of zombies being a catalyst is even more blatant when a biker gang appears to raid the mall. The gang is far more dangerous than any of the zombies that we've encountered so far. Oh look, a Republican! By having the cops raid a housing complex in the first act of the film, and a biker gang raid the mall in the end of the film, Romero is drawing a direct comparison between these violent aggressors and these violent aggressors. Romero explores this idea that some people just want to kill, and illustrates that people who are inclined to use violence to control others will exploit a catastrophe to justify their violence. Snyder seems to take the opposite approach, that killing is cool and fun and manly, that human relations are hollow, that human life is worthless, because we're all dead. So we've seen how Zack Snyder's directorial debut takes the original 1978 film and strips away its radical, anti-capitalist messaging and replaces it with regressive rhetoric. And this seems to be a pattern in his larger filmography. From Dawn of the Dead to Watchmen to Superman, Snyder has a tendency to snatch up intellectual properties that have a strong progressive message and recode them as hardline conservative propaganda. Dawn of the Dead goes from being a critique of consumer culture to a brutal allegory for the Christian apocalypse. Watchmen goes from being a postmodern analysis of hero worship to a celebration of vigilante justice. And Superman goes from being a kind-hearted member of the community to a scowling, cold-blooded killer who serves as a private contractor for the American military. So to anyone who says, keep your politics out of my comic book movies, I just gotta say, we really need to recognize the fact that Snyder's movies are utterly political. His Dawn of the Dead is as political as Romero's Dawn of the Dead, just completely in the other direction. We've really been through a lot together, haven't we? I hope you feel like we really connected over these movies. Let's keep that bond going. Comment below and let me know how you would die in the Zack Snyder universe. Falling concrete, being blown up, or being lobotomized. <laughs> There's so many choices. Be sure to join me next time when we explore how Zack Snyder constructs gender as we ask, who is a Martha? What is a Martha? And most importantly, should we save Martha? Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of my patrons for making it possible for me to keep making these videos. If you'd like to support too, head over to patreon.com slash Fish, where you can see these videos earlier than the general public, give feedback on edits, and get your name in the credits. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell button for notifications. Until next time, yeah sure, we'll save Martha.